Welcome to AETC, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Myself, Dr. Evan Shaggy John. I am a PG resident in Emergency Medicine. But today, I will be presenting the topic Arterial Line Insertion. Okay. So, I will be talking about the indications, the contraindications, the prerequisites before the procedure, the methods, the sites, uh, complications of the procedure, the mechanism of action, and the post procedure monitoring and troubleshooting. So coming to the indications, so the main use of this uh, artery line insertion is for continuous moment-to-moment -moment blood pressure measurement. So this is mainly done for the hemodynamically unstable patients or patients requiring in inotropic support or any hypertensive patients with intracranial hemorrhages or any aortic dissections or any abdominal aortic aneurysms or in any patients undergoing major surgery for the continuous BP monitoring. It's also used for frequent ABG analysis as in severe acid-base disturbance or monitoring of oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in patients with respiratory failure. And coming to the contraindications, uh, it is contraindicated if there are known deficiencies in collateral circulation as in uh, seen in uh, Raynaud's phenomenon or any thromboangiitis subject trans uh, brachial artery insufficiency. It's also contraindicated if there's any infection at the site or if there's a trauma to the proposed site or any excessive anticoagulation. Uh, coming to the arterial site, uh, the radial artery has low complication rates, hence it is the preferred site for insertion. It is actually a superficial artery which have, actually helps in the insertion and also makes it compressible for hemostasis. And it also has a collateral blood supply from the ulnar artery which lowers the risk of complications. And the other alternative sites are the ulnar brachial axillary dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial femoral arteries. The dorsalis pedis artery is superficial and also has collateral circulation similar to the radial artery. Okay, so coming to the prerequisites, you have to perform the Allen's test to determine the collateral circulation between the ulnar and radial arteries to the hand prior to the procedure. So if the ulnar perfusion is poor and if the cannula in the radial artery gets occluded, the blood flow to the hand will be compromised. So for this procedure, we'll ask the patient to cleanse the hand and the ulnar and radial arteries are occluded with digital pressure. And then the hand is unclenched and the pressure of the ulnar artery only is released. And if there is good collateral perfusion, the palm should flush in less than six seconds. So this is the Allen's test. So we will initially occlude both the ulnar and radial arteries and we will tell him to clench his hand, his fist and uh, after that we will uh, unclench the fist and we will only leave the ulnar artery and we will check for flushing of hand. If there is flushing of hand, uh, there is a good collateral supply and we can proceed with the procedure. So coming to the equipments, we'll have to arrange for the arterial cannula, which is made from polytetrachloroethylene, which is Teflon, and it minimizes the risk of clot formation. So the cannula size, uh, the larger gauge cannula can increase the risk of thrombosis, and smaller cannula can cause damping of the signal. So the appropriate size of the cannula has to be choose, chosen. And uh, in adult patients, we use a 20 gauge pink cannula in pediatric patients. We use 22 gauge blue cannula and in neonates and small babies, we use a 24 gauge yellow cannula. The cannula is connected to an arterial giving set. And uh, arterial set consists of a specialized plastic tubing, which is short and stiff to reduce resonance. And this is connected to a 500 ml bag of saline. The saline bag is actually a 500 ml 0.9 percentage saline, which is pressurized to 300 millimeters of mercury using a pressure bag. But this is actually a pressure higher than the arterial systolic pressure to in order to prevent the backflow from the cannula into the giving set. The arterial set and the pressurized saline bag 
the 2500 units heparin, it incorporates a continuous slow flushing system of around 3 to 4 ml per hour to keep the line free from clots. The arterial set and arterial line should be free from any air bubbles and the line is attached to a transducer. We should not allow the saline back to empty to maintain the patency of the arterial cannula for accuracy of BP reading and to prevent air embolism and backflow of blood. The transducer is zeroed and placed at the level of heart. So we have basically the cannulation equipments and the monitoring equipments. The cannulation equipments include the arterial catheter with guide wire, the lidocaine solutions and small gauge needle and serum for giving the local anesthesia, and the powdered iodine or chlorhexidine cleaning solution. The suture material can be 30 or 40 nylon with a straight needle. A sterile personal protective gear, which includes gloves, mask, hair covering, arm board or towel roll to immobilize and expose the arterial side, sterile transparent dressing, and a gauze. The monitoring equipment include the electronic monitoring equipment, the transducer and dough, the constant flush device, the fluid filled non compliant tubing with stop cocks, the connecting cable, the monitor with amplifier. So here you have the arterial cannulation equipment. You have here the arm board. You have the arterial catheter, the guide wire, and the antiseptic, the local anesthetic. And uh, you have here the transducer with the tubings. And here is the electronic transducer and cable which connects to the monitor. So coming to the procedure, we have to position the patient. For radial artery approach, the wrist is extended and the towel roll is kept under the dorsal wrist to maintain a dorsiflex position. For femoral artery approach, the hip is slightly abducted and the leg slightly externally rotated. You have to ensure that all pre procedure steps are taken and the, all the equipments are arranged. The pressure tubing with the transducer is connected to the bedside monitor. And we have to wash hands and wear gown, mask, and hair covering, and we should not stand in direct line of the catheter. So this is the positioning for the radial artery cannulation. So the towel roll is kept in the dorsal aspect of the wrist to keep it in a dorsal flex position so that uh, the uh, artery, radial artery is exposed better. So after that, we have to identify the artery using either landmark, which is by palpating the pulse with two fingers or under USD guidance. We have to prep and rape the patient using standard sterile procedure. We have to give local anesthesia with 1% uh, lidocaine in all conscious patients. We have to stabilize the artery by pulling the skin taut and we to hold the arterial catheter in the dominant hand at 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin surface. We have to advance the needle slowly through the skin and subcutaneous tissue until a pulsatile red blood returns or flashback is obtained. So this is how we can locate the radial artery under USD guidance. We have to place the probe over the distal end of the arm in the transverse plane to locate the radial artery. And on the right side, you can confirm it with the help of a Doppler and you can see the color flow. We have to stabilize the needle with the non-dominant hand and advance the catheter of the needle or needle and guide wire if used. So to remove the needle or needle guide wire unit and occlude the catheter with the finger to prevent arterial blood loss and air embolism. Attach the arterial line set up to the catheter and check for arterial waveform on the monitor. Cleanse the area of any blood and allow the site to dry. Secure the catheter with suture and apply sterile transparent dressing. So these are the two techniques we use. One is the direct angiocatheter technique. In this, the Catheter, angiocatheter, and the needle are held at a 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin with the dominant hand and advanced into the artery. After this, the catheter is advanced over the needle and into the artery. And in the right side, you can see the integral guide wire technique for arterial cannulation. The integral catheter unit is held at a 30 to 45 degree angle and slowly advanced into the artery. After this, the guide wire is advanced into the artery and the catheter is advanced in over the guide wire and into the artery with a gentle twisting motion. This is how we secure the vascular catheter 
onto the adjacent skin using a 3-0 or a 4-0 silk suture. We have to dispose of the IV shafts and other used materials. Align the stop cock to the level of heart. Turn the stop cock off to the patient and open to air. Adjust the monitor display to zero. We have to monitor for any signs of bleeding, hematoma or infection. And we have to assess for the continued need for the arterial line daily. So in this diagram, you can see the arterial line connection. This is the pressure transducer and the automatic flushing system. This is the pressure tubing. It is connected to the pressure bag. And the other side is connected via cables to the monitor. And this is also the another tubing which is connected to the arterial line catheter. So coming to the complications, there can be pain at the site of insertion or any hematoma formation or hemorrhage. To avoid this, we can make sure that the connections are tightly secured and we avoid multiple pricks. There can also be any artery laceration or injury or any arterial vasus passing. This can also be prevented by avoiding any multiple pricks. There can also be pseudoaneurysm formation. This can be prevented by giving uh, compression with the help of an external compression bandage if the procedure fails. There can also be infection at the site and we have to follow all, all aseptic precautions during the procedure to prevent this. There can be limb ischemia and we have to perform the Allen's test before procedure to check for the collateral circulation. There can be thrombosis or any emboli and we have to prevent this by taking care that there should not be any air bubbles present in the lens. There can also be a nerve damage or neuropathy. And we should also make sure that they, we should never inject anything into an arterial line, as it can lead to skin necrosis, severe gangrene, limb ischemia, amputation, and permanent disabilities. Coming to the mechanism of action. The transducer is a device that reads the fluctuations in pressure. It doesn't matter if it is artery or central venous or pulmonary artery pressure. The column of saline in the arterial set transmits the pressure changes to the diaphragm in the transducer. This transducer then reads the changing pressure and changes it into an electrical signal that goes up and down as the pressure does, which is displayed as an arterial waveform. The transducer connects to the bedside monitor with a cable and the wave shows up on the screen going from left to right. And also the transducer has to be leveled correctly to make sure that it's at the fourth interposter space at the mid axillary line, which is the phlebostatic axis. You should also make sure there's no air in the line before you hook it up to the patient. And you should use the pressure to clear any bubbles out of the tube. That is zero the line to atmosphere pressure properly. So this is the phlebostatic axis, which is at the fourth intercostal space in the mid axillary line. And this is where the transducer zero point should be at. Coming to the zeroing of the transducer, to ensure accuracy of readings, you have to flush the device and turn it off to patient but open to the atmosphere. This exerts pressure on transducer and this pressure is called zero. Zero it once for shift or if values are questionable. You have to ensure the flush bag is pumped up. So once inserted, an arterial waveform trace should be displayed at all times. This confirms that the invasive arterial BP monitoring is set up correctly and it minimizes problems. This ensures the success of the procedure. So in this, we can see the red arterial waveform in this image. This is the arterial waveform. In this, you can see the systolic upstroke, the systolic peak pressure here, and then there is a systolic decline followed by a dichrotic notching, and then there's the diastolic runoff and the end diastolic pressure. So this is the abnormal arterial waveform traces. So this one is the normal trace, which I showed earlier, and it can either reduce in size to an uh, over damped trace, or it can increase in height to an under damped trace. So these over damped waveform occurs due to any air bubbles in the tubings or any overly compliant distensible tubing, catheter kings, clots, or a low flush back pressure or no fluid in the flush back 
in proper scaling, severe hypertension if everything else is ruled out. And in this type of cases, uh, it actually underestimates the systolic blood pressure and overestimates the diastolic blood pressure. Uh, the underdam waveform occurs mainly due to the long tubing, or the, uh, the tubing is overly stiff or non compliant, or if there is an increased vascular resistance, or if there are any reverberations in tubing causing harmonics that distorts the trace, or if there is a not fully opened stopcock valve. Okay, and this trace uh, actually overestimates the systolic blood pressure and underestimates the diastolic blood pressure opposite of the previous one. Okay, and uh, comparing this invasive BP with the non-invasive BP, usually the systolic blood pressure approximately measures 5 millimeter of mercury higher than the non-invasive BP and the diastolic BP measures 8 millimeter mercury lower than the non-invasive BP. Okay, summing to the troubleshooting when arterial waveform disappears. So first of all, we have to confirm the arterial line position by drawing blood with the syringe from the stop cord. So if it drops normally, then there's a hardware problem. So we have to check the check cable connections. And then you have to set the optimum scale and zeroing of transducer needs to be done. Then after that, we have to remove the sterile dressing and check for if there is any catheter kinking. And we have to also check for any clot in the hub of the catheter. If there is arterial vascular spasm, then a new arterial line needs to be placed if it is required. The transducer setup has to be changed after 96 hours or earlier if it is contaminating in any way. And also we have to remove assess for coloring, sensation, motion and capillary refill if the pulse diminishes and goes away altogether. We have to also change the artery line if it is threatening the patient's hand. The artery line has to be removed once the patient is hemodynamically stable and needs no more EBG. While removing the artery line, we should make sure that we manually compress the site with a gauze piece for at least 3 to 5 minutes. And we have to also check for any hematoma or bleeding. So I hope you have all understood how to do an artery lane procedure. Thank you so much for listening.